Welcome to Conlang Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Meesley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of the heavens, Dursk. Drisk? Hmm. Yeah, I'm going with Dursk. Dursk is a fictional language created by Isra Kathath Zorathan, who has been posting about it online since early 2017. Isra Kathath is a Conlanger and world builder based in Hong Kong, and he's made an impressive amount of Conlangs. Dursk is one of many. Information about Dursk has been cross-posted on his Reddit, Twitter, and Tumblr accounts. Before I started researching for this review, Isarak reached out to me through Tumblr and very kindly sent me an in-progress reference grammar for Dursk, which has been an extremely valuable resource. Fictionally, Dursk is spoken in the country... Clip... Closer... Uh... Kulsurdmuk on the planet Pisaru by a human-like species called Keelys. While Keelys are similar to humans, they aren't exactly the same, and the languages they speak highlight these differences. Dursk itself is particularly alien, but is it far enough from everything we're used to to be sure to make linguists claim that it is the language of the heavens? Dursk's consonants are... Well, that's, uh, certainly something. Where do I even start with this? Well, I should probably reiterate that Dursk isn't spoken by humans, so the fact that this inventory is weird shouldn't be surprising. Regardless, there are still some things here that bug me. First of all, there's this thing, transcribed in the IPA as V Tybar N, which is referred to as a nasal dental affricate. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but none of the options I'm thinking of are affricates. In general, this inventory is just really asymmetric. I know I say that a lot, but for Dursk, there really isn't any way of looking at these consonants without something looking out of place. Like, why are there no phonemes here that are both aspirated and palatalized? It leaves both features feeling incomplete, not allowing them to interact. Dursk's vowels are... Yeah, that's right. Dursk doesn't have any phonemic vowels. How bizarre. This is, however, rather misleading. Dursk does have vowels, they're just inserted between consonants in a way that's largely regular and predictable. But before we get into that, we need to talk about the phonoren. One of the more significant things when discussing the phonology of a spoken language is its syllable structure, what sequences of phonemes can make up a syllable. However, Dursk, apparently, doesn't have syllables. Instead, it has something that Isarak calls phonorens. Phonorens, or just runs, are an alternative to syllables created for Isarak's earlier languages, such as Ratsa, fictionally spoken in the same region as Dursk. Basically, the idea is that a phonoren is a sequence of similar sounds grouped together. While a syllable has some sound, typically a vowel, as its nucleus, surrounded by consonants on either side, a phonoren has no internal structure, and its sounds can only be considered one unit due to their shared features. There is no limit for how long a phonoren can be, or what order its sounds can occur in. Due to this defining lack of structure, I don't think it makes literally any sense to use phonorens as a way of defining a language's phonotactics. They are completely arbitrary and don't add any more information about a language's sound system than simply claiming that there are no restrictions for what order phonemes may appear in. In Dursk, phonorens work differently from how they do in languages like Ratsaw. Dursk's phonemes are divided into categories of similar sounds, but instead of a phonorun consisting of a sequence of sounds within any one category, some phonemes are labeled as terminators, which immediately end the current run. Here, I've highlighted all the terminating phonemes. The ones in darker red can function either as terminators or non-terminators. As you can see, the terminators actually outnumber the non-terminators. Anyway, that stuff doesn't really matter, since the vowel insertion rules pretty much negate all of this. So while vowels can, in theory, be freely inserted in Dursk, since they don't carry any meaning, there are, in fact, rules for where they usually go. And this is where everything falls apart. This is Dursk's normal syllable structure. This syllable structure is defined explicitly as part of Dursk's vowel insertion rules, and as far as I can tell, it does not in any way interact with phonorens. Which vowel gets inserted is determined by the following consonant, with some room for dialectal variation. Dursk, however, basically has these nine vowels phonetically. True, they're not phonemic, and yes, you can predict where within a word they show up. But like, come on. The claim that Dursk is a language without vowels or even syllables is pretty inaccurate, don't you think? Dursk is written using an alphabet created for that Ratsaw language I mentioned earlier. In fiction, Dursk hasn't used it for very long, so its orthography is completely phonemic. It's kinda boring, but I guess it makes sense. What doesn't make sense is the fact that Dursk's vowels aren't written. 
I can't say they're not phonemic, but vowels are phonemic in Ratsa. The alphabet Dursk uses has letters for vowels. It would make more sense if the writing system Dursk borrowed from was an abjad or an abugida or something, where it's normal to not write vowels that can be inferred through context, but not for an alphabet. Then there's the romanization, which I guess is technically a fully defined romanization. That's more than I can say for some other conlangs I've seen recently. Those superscript letters all over the place used to be digraphs, but since there's a risk of ambiguity, the digraphs all had their second letters superscripted. Personally, I'd have gone with the humble inner punct instead to solve this. Now, a lot of things in here don't make very much sense and aren't very helpful, but since Dursk uses the Ratsaw alphabet, it's actually just the same romanization used for Ratsaw copied directly. So things that don't make sense for Dursk do make sense for Ratsaw. So while double S for sh might not make very much sense, and it would have been more useful to write it like sh or x, in Ratsaw, the same letter was used for the sound ts, which, wait, hold on, it doesn't make any sense for that either. What's even going on here? You know what, this is like the least important thing about this language, so I'm just going to move on. Nouns in Dursk are a closed class due to their highly structured nature. There really isn't any room for new nouns to be created. A Dursk noun consists of a prefix for grammatical gender, a basic root, and a suffix for case. Now, Dursk's grammatical gender system is extremely complex. Grammatical gender consists of three parts, the supermajor category, major category, and minor category. This is essentially a three-layer taxonomy of nouns. So, as an example, here's the word for iron. The basic root here is actually just the letter P. The D at the start means the super major category is material. The weird not affricate thing means the major category is solid metallic. And then the double SH thing means the minor category is usable. The last consonant is the case suffix. This reminds me of Ithquil, a language I like a lot specifically for how densely it packs information. But Ithquil is an engineered language, specifically aiming to have as much information per phoneme as possible. Dursk is a fictional language, and Iserak expects me to believe that this system could conceivably develop naturally. Well, Dursk definitely couldn't be a natural human language, but perhaps the Keelys who speak Dursk simply have brains that were completely different from humans. Who's to say how likely this is in-universe? I can see why someone else might be able to suspend their disbelief for this, I just can't. Nouns end with suffixes indicating their case. There are nine total, some covering a few different cases. The transitive case there is used both for subjects and objects of transitive verbs. This is one of the rarest morphosyntactic alignments in human languages, often overlooked when discussing the concept. Not nominative-accusative or ergative-absolutive, but transitive-intransitive. It's a pretty cool way to do it. Pronouns basically work by removing the word's root, leaving only the case and gender information. This actually works for all kinds of words, not just nouns. There's three other pro-words that exist, which aren't supposed to be general for second- and third-person pronouns, but, like, they kinda are. So the velar nasal word can be used as a replacement of whatever, which makes sense because the normal pro words are often not that much shorter than the words they're replacing. It also makes sense to not label this as an actual third-person pronoun, since it can take the place of any word. But then there's the other two. The first means the author, and the second means the audience. When defining them, Iserak claims, quote, These don't necessarily correspond to the first and second person pronouns. They totally do, though. The alleged difference is that when you're talking about something someone else said before you, the author pronoun refers to that person, and the audience pronoun refers to whoever they were talking to. I don't know what about this makes these no longer first and second person pronouns. An example Israq uses to demonstrate this difference is a sentence explaining what Dora the Explorer is about. As we all know, in English it would make no sense to say something like, Dora the Explorer teaches you the alphabet. I mean, you'd have to be, quote, particularly dim not to see that, haha. In direct contrast with the highly structured nouns, verbs in Dursk are far less structured. Iserak uses an analogy where verbs are water, and nouns are islands in the water. Verbs can, in general, basically go anywhere within a sentence, except for the verb f, which means and. Yes, that's a verb. One term used in the description of Dursk is dredge, which Merriam-Webster defines as an apparatus usually in the form of an oblong iron frame with an attached bag net used especially for gathering fish and shellfish, or a machine for removing earth usually by buckets or an endless chain or a suction tube. What could this possibly mean in a linguistic context? Iserak refers to inflectionless dredge morphemes, verb-like dredge, and relational super dredge. They're basically just grammatical particles. They're mostly used for tense aspect and mood information. I have no idea why they need a neologism. Isra Kafiv is a world builder, and discussing Dursk as a language without also discussing the culture exists within is definitely selling it short. Reading through his blog for the purposes of this review, I found descriptions of color perception, road signage, timekeeping, and calculus. Of course, you all know me and what I'm into, so let's take a quick look at Dursk's numbers. The numbering system in Dursk uses something called a state machine to construct its digits. Each digit is formed starting with two, using the operators double, triple, and decrement. So the word for seven literally means one less than twice twice two. 
This system is the sort of thing you'd get from a culture that invented math before inventing counting. And all digits work this way, even the smallest ones. Zero is one less than one less than two. One is one less than two. Three is one less than twice two, and so on. This is not, however, used for all numbers, just the digits. And the digits are, I'm sorry to say, from zero to eleven because Dursk uses base 12. Not only does Dursk use base 12, but if you ignore the way the digits are constructed, it uses base 12 in the most boring possible way, just listing the digits of a number in decimal in order from most to least significant. Yeah, sure, there is more to it than that, and indeed, Dursk does have support for other bases, even including seximal, but that doesn't change how, a uh, constructive it feels. One aspect of Dursk that's really informative of what its speaker's culture is like is how it handles names of individuals. A name consists of four parts, referred to as status, origin, commune, and unit. The status, as the name suggests, refers to the general state of whoever you're talking about, in terms of their well-being and what role in society they have relative to you. So there's fitness, ranging all the way from someone in their prime to someone who's dead, combined with engagement, which is basically whether or not whoever you're talking about has an active role in society, combined together with one of five casts. Like a lot of things in Dursk, the names used for the casts aren't very helpful. Specifically, relative inferior is actually the default, the one you'd use when talking about your peers. Equal is less about actually being of equal status to the speaker, and more of a neutral option for when you don't want to specify cast. Next, there's the origin. Two letters referring to where the individual is from. Usually a shortened form of the name of the place itself. Finally, commune and unit, which are basically just the family name and personal name parts of the name, though the commune part of the name is more about who you hang out with than it is about who you're related to. This somewhat complex name system is a good indicator of what values the Kiwis who speak Dursk have. Whenever they talk about someone and want to use their full name, it's important to them to indicate their level of health, where they're from, and who they spend time with. There's one more aspect of Dursk-speaking culture that I should probably mention here. So, on Pisaru, the planet Dursk is spoken on, the most common type of fiction is something called world-state literature, defined by a lack of characters. So, rather than stories that are based around some protagonist and the things that happen to them, the plot found in world-state literature is more big picture. The star isn't the characters, but the setting. Highly detailed descriptions of fictional worlds and the cultures within them, with no need for a three-act structure or a conflict that gets resolved. For Isarok's target audience of his fellow world builders and conlangers, this provides the escapist fantasy of a world where the type of thing you make is what everyone is into. Can you imagine? At least that's what I assume world state literature is supposed to be. When Isarok talks about his motivations behind the idea of world state literature, he doesn't make this comparison to world building himself. In his essay, A Case Against the Character, Isarok not only explains why he believes that stories without characters have potential, but also why he dislikes characters in general. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested, but his main argument seems to be that 1. You're supposed to emphasize with characters. 2. Characters can change how they behave over time. And 3. Things in the story happen specifically to put characters in interesting situations. And so that's what he doesn't like about characters. I guess. The following text is titled The Horse and the Stone an allegory posted on Tumblr by Isra Kathath in March 2017. Ironically, it's a straightforward story with a protagonist and a moral. Pimigit klipit fin ne kris reit nis. Klipit pimigil zi ek smilpit pimigil skilt. Jerft vnim kit pimirt ksitrizl. Fit kit sikrastip pit kisl. Zid pit lizitifim vernel pizr. Fit Christi pit nit ev pither kick ir kir kiv rev. Hang fit ev kirfir nit. Hain se big fip thick fit nit thir wither pit kit fees. Zig dith tic tac. Fip pit zkit zim irk. All in all, Dursk is a disappointment. It does have its charms, and I understand why someone else might like it, but it's not my thing. As I've said before, a fictional language is a story, and the story of Dursk is one that I have a hard time relating to. I can appreciate the effort that went into it, but most of the things Dursk has going for it would be better suited to an engineered language, not a fictional language. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll be reviewing Sambasa. Nili na sinta solon tempo Sina olin bakala Nitawa ampa Taso sina awem Bilimpo na Fight kill